All right, how's it going, y'all? Today we are having an absolute home lab episode where I'm gonna be talking about some of the services that I'm self-hosting in my home lab. I don't even know if you can call it a home lab anymore at this point. It's half a business lab, half a home lab. Either way, it's still my home lab at heart. And these are gonna be a bunch of different services that I'm hosting that are really useful for me and my business. The majority of these are gonna be open source, but there are gonna be some things that, something like Plex, where I do use closed source software because in my experience, it is just better. And we're gonna be talking about a bunch of these here and just stuff you can implement. These can be things that the majority of them can be straight up implemented on something like a Synology NAS, or you can start going crazy like I have and start building out an entire server room in your guest bedroom and it just grows and grows from there. All right, so now to cap this video somewhere, we are not going to be going over any kind of file servers or virtual machine managers or anything like that. We are going to go straight into the actual services running on top of those. Just to go over that really quickly for those who are interested, I use a combination of Synology NAS as well as TrueNAS Scale for my file servers. I have 100 terabytes in TrueNAS Scale with eight terabytes of SSDs, no, 16 terabytes of SSDs on there for video editing running this YouTube channel, as well as running backups for a lot of clients and things like that. And then Synology is just hard for me to get out of because there's so many useful features in there that make it very difficult to self-host. So those are the two things I use for my file servers. Overkill, certainly. And then for my virtual machine managers, I use XCPNG managed by Zen Orchestra. Phenomenal, open source, you can get everything completely free and it's incredibly powerful with by far the best virtual machine backups out there, in my opinion. I can do incredibly instantaneous restores, really, really, really easy, all managed by single pane of glass. I've stood up for numerous clients and it's just great with no license fees, which is awesome. All right, so now we're going to actually get straight into the actual services that I'm running and what I really enjoy. And we're going to start off with a pretty basic setup here. And that is you need a database somewhere. So I am running MariaDB 10.6 right now, and you really should start up with a database. It's well worth it for you to have a database on your network and that you can just start adding everything to. A lot of services that you're going to want to be able to run, pretty much anything with a web browser is going to need a database. And now a lot of Docker containers will have you the dummy mode where it uses a SQLite flat file. Really, you want to make sure you use a database though. So spin up a MariaDB instance and install PHP my admin on there and you are going to be set. The reason you want to do this is you want to have one centralized database for two reasons. One, by having a managed database, you get way better performance out of it rather than using a flat file like SQLite. And two, it makes backups really easy. Whenever you're setting up a database, you need to set up a cron job that automatically backs up and does a dump of the entire database to a file because databases get corrupted. Most file systems are totally fine with an unexpected power loss. They're resilient, they'll be fine. Databases, there's so much caching involved that if you have a power outage or a computer crashes, you're almost certain to have some corrupted database tables. Trust me, speaking from experience here. So to combat that, you essentially just wanna set up a MySQL dump, and I'll make a video on this at one point, where you essentially just dump the contents of the database to a file that literally, all you would have to do is execute that in SQL, and you would recreate the database. So I have a cron job that runs every single night, that dumps it to a file and then zips it, and it also then rsyncs it to another server. That's probably unnecessary for you, but just make sure you have a script that runs that does a MySQL dump every single night because you may have to go to that if you have a crash or anything like that. You don't want to lose the database to all your different programs. The other thing is install PHP my admin. I've got it running right here. And it is so nice to have all of this. It makes administering a database so much easier. You just have to do command line to set up the very first time. And then after that, it's so much easier to set up everything and you're not gonna fat finger something and accidentally delete it. If you are just getting started, it also has a great export button. And what you can do is you can just do a quick export of the entire thing. And then if anything does happen, at least you've got that before you start off on that cron job, but definitely install PHP my admin on it. And it is so nice to have. We can go into the Zavix tables and say, oh, hey, look, 
here are all the tables. Here is everything. You can just understand what's going on. And we're going to get to Zabbix in a minute here, but look at that. My history is already five gigs and five gigs in a database is a lot of data. It just makes it really easy for everything to be understood here. And it is phenomenal. So MariaDB running on a box with PHP, my admin running on top of that. Beautiful. These are also easy enough to do on Synologies. Literally you just install MariaDB and PHP my admin and it just works. So you can absolutely do this, but you definitely want to start off by having a database server somewhere as a constant place to do it because so many of those Docker containers you download will say, Hey, this works for testing with a flat file. Don't use it, but you'll be using in production and you'll get poor performance and possible data corruption where all of a sudden it just doesn't work because of a hard crash. That's why you really want to start off by having a database. And also whenever you create a new database, you essentially say who has access to that database from what IP address. And that way you have very limited amount of users who do that. All right. So that was the first one. You want to start off with a database server just so you never have to do it again. And everything is just run on there by having one of them. You only have to worry about backing up a single database and not having to worry about a bunch of other stuff. And so I would really recommend that. All right. And so now on to number two is going to be a Git server. You can choose however you'd like to manage it, but probably for the majority of people, Git T is going to be the best solution. If you're really fancy and you want to start playing with like CI pipelines and everything like that, you can use GitLab, but it's going to be overkill and unnecessary for you almost certainly. So you want to set up a Git T server. So right here, this is my Git T server and we can just go ahead and sign in. And this has all my commits to it. So I can see all the commits. I've got repositories, everything can pull from there. And it's just nice having a web UI to see everything rather than just trying to do everything command line to remember, okay, what's that get and everything like that. Instead, you've got everything running right here and it makes it easy to have HTTPS as well for pulling really nice to have. And so by having a web Git server, it makes it so much easier to just see stuff and not have to download everything to figure out what's in what files. If I want to pull out a file from my bind config, I can just see it all right here. I can see them. I can download them. It's easy to see the commits and I don't have to do git command line for everything. It's just really nice to see all of it. So I'd highly recommend go ahead, get a Git server stood up. And anytime you're making custom config files for stuff, put it in a Git repo and commit it. Git is a phenomenal thing to get used to using. And it integrates with, I mean, you can get VS code has great Git integration. It is really, really, really nice to have. So whenever you're typing off these like random, even one off scripts, you'll see I've got a branch right here, which is like miscellaneous scripts. And so anytime I need to write something, I do it and I just commit it to Git because so often you'll, you'll make a single script and you're like, Oh crap, I did something similar a few months ago. I wish I had that here. It's just right there. Absolutely worth it. Set up your own Git server. It's phenomenal to have one. All right. So the next thing I would set up and I would actually probably set this up very early on in your network. If you can set up a DNS server, but before you just go ahead and jumping right into this, you need to know you should only set this up if you know what you're doing. And if you're going to do it, you have to have two DNS servers running because you do not want one of your computers to go down and your spouse to get very mad at you because all of a sudden now the internet does not work. So if you're running a DNS server and you're running it as your primary DNS server, you need at least two DNS servers and they should be on two different virtual machine managers if you've got them, or you can always set up one as a Raspberry Pi. So I've actually got three. Well, right now one of them's down. The Raspberry Pi is down. It fried itself, but I've got running on two different servers. And then the third one was on a Raspberry Pi just because DNS is that really, really, really crucial thing to have. And the reason you want to run DNS is so you can see what I've been doing up here. So to get to all my servers, I don't have to remember an IP address or anything like that. To, for me to get to Zen Orchestra, I just go to X001 and it just takes me right there. Literally, that's all I got to type in. That is because I've got two things running. First off are DNS records. So I've got DNS servers running and that's what I'm using bind for. And so DNS allows me to have a DNS record for every single one of the IP addresses on my NAS. Every single service has its own IP address. And then that IP address is associated with a DNS record. So xo01.sr.spacerex.co 
leads to this site, this IP address. And so now if I ever migrate this to a new VM with a new IP address, I just update that record once and it's updated everywhere. It also means you do not have to memorize all these random IP addresses and it keeps you really organized. Unify and PFSense both have the ability for custom DNS records now, which is huge. PFSense had it forever. Unify finally added them, which you can probably do there. And so that way you don't have the extra complexity because if your router goes down, well, your internet is already down. It doesn't matter at that point, but definitely set up a DNS server somehow, even if it's just on your router, because it is so nice to have that. And so just to clear up one thing you may have noticed, I said that the DNS record was xo01.sr.spacerex.co, and I just did a dig here to show you. And that leads to 10.30.1.61. Well, I over here only typed in xo01. That's because of a DNS search domain. So in your router's DHCP settings, you probably have an option for what's called a search domain. Essentially the way that works is, if you do not type an extension on it, so I typed x001 without a dot or anything after it, it will just tack on whatever domain you have to that. So I go into my networking preferences over here in my computer, and this is also available on Windows and Linux, and I go into the network under advanced, under DNS, you will see this search domain, .sr.spacerex.co. So that means that if I do not type an additional address on the end, it's going to say, hey, if I add .sr.spacerex.co to the end of this, does that work? And so that way you save a ton of typing and it makes it a lot easier. So if you've got your own website or your own web domain, it's great to have that because it makes all this stuff so much easier. The other thing is, as you grow and expand, you may want to open things up to the internet and then you can do that from this process without changing anything by just changing your public DNS server. Really, really, really powerful stuff. All right, so that was DNS. Absolutely phenomenal. Really great to get started on. And you'll see that everything in here is via DNS. So if I ever need to update an IP address, it's updated once and not having to do it in 15 different places because that can be so annoying. I can also migrate services from one place to the other by just saying, all right, now check for this IP address now instead of this other one. All right, and so the next thing that's absolutely phenomenal that I use in self-host right here is HomeBridge. I inherited a smart home accidentally, but I inherited it and it is awesome. I am able to turn off every single light and everything just works really, really, really well. Even stuff that does not work with Apple's HomeKit. So, I run an Apple house, pretty much everything in here are Apple devices. And so I want everything to come into Apple. I have a Nest thermostat, a unified doorbell, and five different types of lights that the previous owner left. And using Homebridge, I was able to get these all into one single ecosystem. So my doorbell right here, I click on it, and it's going to load in the feed. There, that is my doorbell live feed. I get a ring, it shows up on the Apple TV. It's awesome. Homebridge is phenomenal. And so it's just an app that you self-host yourself and you install plugins. So I've got a plugin that takes in the Nest, the Hubitat, the Unify Protect, everything. It brings it all together into one system and it works phenomenally well. Definitely, if you have a smart home and you want to bring everything into a single ecosystem, for Apple, it's Homebridge. There's also other ones Home Assistant also works very well for people. If you're looking for a lot more customization, you want to run it on your own services, really, it's great. And it can all work locally where possible. Something like Nest, unfortunately, has to use the API to go up and do that. But for the most part, everything just comes in and works really, really, really well, which has been phenomenal. Definitely Homebridge is awesome, especially some of the plugins like Homebridge Unify Protect that allows you to bring in every single one of your Unify cameras straight in here. Phenomenal, works really well and absolutely worth it. And once again, everything I've mentioned so far is free open source. Great to have. Then I've got a couple more quick ones. Nextcloud I use somewhat, I'm planning on switching over to more and more. Definitely something to look for if you don't have a Synology. Right now, honestly, Synology Drive works so well, it's hard for me to use instead of that. But definitely look at Nextcloud or Synology Drive to manage your files and the ability to share files with other people and things like that and then for monitoring Zabbix. This is where you can absolutely go down a rabbit hole, but for monitoring all these things you're putting up, it is huge. 
So Zabbix deserves 15 tutorials in and of itself, but what it essentially allows you to do is it allows you to monitor anything, just about anything from one pane of glass. So right here under hosts, I have Linux servers, I have Synology NASes, I have TrueNAS boxes, I have Unify switches, I have Unify Wi-Fi access points, I have my web server. It's all in here and it's all being monitored directly through Zabbix. Zabbix has unbelievable templates once you get used to them that allow you to monitor so many different services. I can go in right here and I can check out exactly the usage of that MariaDB server. I can see exactly what it is using and how it's doing. And it will pop up with an issue if it has an issue. There's all these auto detects. So people build these unbelievable templates for them. Use the templates. Definitely do not try to build any templates yourself for a very long time, but use the pre-built templates and they've got these auto detections. So if you're running out of space on one of your VMs, you can see that rather than having to go to every single one of your VMs. It has great, great, great options here. And once again, totally open source. I have been using this all the time for my clients now, where I've got connections to each of my clients NASA's over an open VPN server one way. And so that means I have this set up on every single one of their machines. I didn't even have to install anything on the Synologies. You just use SMTP and I can see, oh, hey, your drive's getting full. Oh, hey, that disk is dying. Oh, hey, this is really high CPU usage. Is everything working fine? You can see and monitor all these things from one pane of glass and keep really, really, really organized. It is tough to set up at first. You have to get it and you have to kind of understand it. But once you build out the templates, so for me, every single one of my virtual machines comes from a template and it already has Zabbix set up and installed and it automatically gets added in there. Once you get to that point, monitoring these things becomes so easy and it's really useful to have one place to monitor everything. There's not a single thing that I'm not monitoring on here, which is great. So that is Zabbix. And finally, there's Plex. I'm not even really gonna talk about Plex too much because you probably already know about it, but I have tried a few other solutions. Plex really has the best option for working across multiple devices and just having all of your data in one place. It's just hard to switch over to something like Jellyfin just because you don't have the awesome apps on every single device in a very standardized format. It is closed source software that costs money. I think it's like $120 lifetime fee. If you want the pro pass, you can start it for free if you want to, but that also goes on sale a lot. But for me, it is worth it, I do believe, just because it's got great user interfaces for every single thing, and it's just been pretty bulletproof for me. All right, well, that is all the really crucial stuff that I am self-hosting. Go ahead, leave any other things you think I should check out in the comments below because I'm always down to see more of these projects. And I'd also like to know what people like me to make tutorials on. I'm moving more and more into the home lab stuff as I finally have gotten it down. And I'd love to know what people are thinking. All right, and finally, if you wanna hire me for a project, I'm a professional IT consultant now somehow, and I've quit my full-time job and do this full-time. There's a link for that in the description below. If you have any questions, put them in the comments and have a good one. Bye.